income tax 2023 2024 other itemized deductions and casualty and theft losses tax software example get ready and some coffee because we'll have to handle a little perspiration so we can push through with our income tax preparation 2023-2024. Here we are in first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse... She rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Our form 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to it, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Starting with our taxpayer, Adam Taxman, just trying to avoid a dang tax man living in Beverly Hills 90210 single filer to start out with no dependents 100,000 W2 income standard deduction at the 13850 to get to the taxable income 86,150 we can mirror that in our income tax formula 100,000 minus the deduction 13850 gets us to the 86150 tax calculated by the software at 14266 to start out with which is on page two of the form 1040 there's our starting point let's go back to the first page our focus this time is going to be on line number 12 which is the greater of the standard deduction or itemized deductions remembering we would only take the itemized if it's greater than the standard which is dependent in large part on the filing status single filers have that standard deduction 13850 married filing joint doubled to 27700 head of household in the middle 20800 and if they are over a certain age and or blind we can see the 1040 sr with added standard deductions for one or both of those conditions if single raised here if married filing joint then you have two people with two possible conditions so we have four possible standard deductions there let's go back to the form 1040 and if we are going to be itemizing we're going to be pulling in the schedule a so let's go on to that schedule a which is the itemized deductions the list of the categories on the left hand side we're down here in the uh, casualty and theft losses and the uh, other itemized deductions so first let's think about the uh, casualty and theft losses which have been restricted this is one of those areas that have kind of grow, grown and then detracted over time and it's been in a period of detraction meaning there's going to be a, a lot of restrictions in terms of what you might be able to include with casualty and theft losses and if you get questions about it many people might be thinking of basically old uh, rules with uh, relation to it now there's also a question as to whether something is going to qualify for a federally declared uh, disaster and whether or not it's something that you can get a, a benefit from only if you itemize or if possibly we can use the itemized deductions as we can basically see uh, here in this other format of the ske schedule a if we had a net qualifying disaster loss in other words depending on the categorization of the type of loss that we have we might be able to use the schedule a to give us a benefit over and above the standard deduction or we might have to 
include it as a standard deduction, which means we'd have to clear the hurdle before we get a benefit from it. Now, note that wherever you are, if you're a tax preparer, then if there was a natural disaster or something that was declared as a disaster in your area, then it's likely that it's going to be impacting clients around you. And then, of course, you want to do your research from uh, that point at that particular uh, location would be, you know, the general idea. So this will be very specific to particular types of uh, locations. But just a general overview of it. Uh, if if we said that there was some kind of loss, some kind of disaster happened, we might be putting that into something similar to like a depreciation kind of schedule or a Schedule D, basically, when, not depreciation, like a Schedule D where we would usually report sales of like stock or something like that, like dispositions. But in this case, we're, we're going to assume that some type of property has been removed from us, right? We, we are... are our location or something uh, was uh, was harmed due to a natural disaster or something like that is the general idea. So then, so then you might have uh, a casualty loss. So I put something down here with regards to a casualty loss. So we might say that the the date acquired. I'm going to say negative 010100 to just have various dates the date sold which is going to be the date basically of the disaster we're going to assume i'm just going to say 06 uh, 05 23 sometime in the tax year the sales price i'm going to assume is basically zero because it was basically destroyed and not sold and i'm going to assume the cost or basis is let's start with 50,000 50,000 and then down here i'm going to put it as a casualty and theft law so it's not going to it's not like a schedule d or capital gain i'm trying to get it as something that could be deducted on uh the the schedule a so i'm going to give it a description i'm going to say it's personal versus business uh, i'm going to say personal in our case and then i'm just going to notice we have a list software will typically give you kind of these lists of the federally declared disasters so that will help you to determine if it's deductible because it should be something that would be declared and have basically a number uh, that has been assigned to it. So if I pick something like a federally uh, declared qualified disaster, actually, let's start with a federally declared disaster other than qualified, and I'll pick that one. And then I'm just going to pick a, a disaster here. And again, this will help you to help you to determine and locate because the disaster should basically have a number to it. So I'm just going to basically pick one to give a general idea here. And I'm going to say that the fair market value uh, before the casualty or theft was 50000 The fair market value after is zero. That might not always be the case because it might not be totally washed away or destroyed or whatever. So you might still have some value uh, within it. Uh, fair market value determined under under safe harbor and then the insurance or some other reimbursement if you got a reimbursement for it then you're going to have to put that there because you got reimbursed for the loss so then if i pull that over and say okay what's that going to do to the form just as a a general outline this is just a general outline here of the data input so then if i scroll down we're going to say all right what uh, what happened here, it, it's put into the casualty and theft losses as opposed to other itemized deductions, casualty and theft losses from a federally declared disaster other than net qualified disaster losses. And we can see that that's pulling in uh, form 4684 and enter the amount. So if I go into the 4684, here's the information from there, casualty and theft losses. And we have the personal use property. So here's the property. And we listed out basically uh, the property. Here's the code that we are using. If there were multiple uh, properties that were lost, then we would have to basically, we can have multiple categories here. And we might even need an addendum or attachment if we had more than that. Here's the cost or basis. And that's going to be a $50,000 loss. In this case, it's got to clear this $100 hurdle, which is kind of a funny thing that's been there for some time with the casualty and theft losses and hasn't really changed, even though the dollar amount seems fairly low at this point. And then it's taking 10% of our adjusted gross income. That's going to be our form 1040 line uh, 11. 
There's line 11, adjusted gross income, pulling into form 4684, where it's taking uh, 10% of that. So the 49,900 minus the 10,000, that's where it's coming up with that 39,900, which is pulling over to the Schedule A, that amount being large enough to clear the standard deduction. And that's why we're able to take it. In this case, it's pulling over then to the Form 1040. And we could see the 41,105 is greater than the uh, 13,850. Therefore, we're itemizing as opposed to the standard deduction, the taxable income at 58,895. Page two, tax is now at 8,260. So if I go back to uh, this 4684, a couple things to note here. If there was something uh, like insurance that was reimbursed, let's say the insurance was 10,000. Then if I go back on over, you would expect the uh, 50,000 we got reimbursed by the insurance. So it's bringing it down to 40,000 minus the 100, 39,900 minus the 10%. We're at the 29,900. Let's say the insurance reimbursement was 20,000 that we got reimbursed for. So now we could see that it's down to 19,900. Let's say the reimbursement of the insurance was 30,000. And we go back on over. And now we can see that we don't, we no longer have the itemized uh, deductions because we still have to clear that hurdle uh, in this particular case. So the 9,900 is pulling in, but that's not enough to pull us over. Okay, so, so we're not itemizing. Now, in some cases, it might be reported down here, which we can see in this Schedule A, depending on the type of disaster that happened. So now we're saying it's going to be a net qualified disaster loss. So similar condition, but now I'm going to say, oh, wait, but what if it was a net qualified disaster law. So I'm just going to pick a federally declared disaster uh, occurring in that period, right? And I'm just going to pick it randomly just so we could kind of get an idea of the of the information. So if I pull that over, then I'm going to undo that. Now it's not in the casualty and theft losses up top, but rather down below where it has the net qualified disaster loss 19,500 and the standard deduction claimed with the qualified disaster loss 13,850. So in this case, we're still using the schedule A in essence, but it's being used in such a way that someone that doesn't qualify for the 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 itemized deductions still gets a benefit from it, which is a little bit wonky, right? It's a little bit tricky, and that's how we're getting up to this 33,350. In other words, if I go up to this form 1040, we can see that 33,350 is here. We had to clear the hurdle of 13,850 in order to get there. To, but what it did is it said, we, we're, going to, we're going to, in this section, give you the disaster loss of the full uh, 19,500 and give you that 13,850. That's how it's getting to the 33,350, uh, uh, which is a substantial uh, deduction on the on that pulls into the first page of the form 1040. Now this is still pulling in from uh, the 4684 casualty and theft losses. So we've got the 50,000, the 30,000 that was reimbursed. There's the 20,000. Then we have the 500 instead of the 100. That's why it brought it about down to that 19,500 and so on. So again, this is just a general kind of concept. So you can kind of see how the flow of the forms might work, but you want to make sure that any kind of losses or, or disaster losses that you have in your area, you're doing the research for them because they can be quite complex, as we saw in prior presentations when we discussed the, you know, the reimbursement of insurance and all that kind of stuff. We can also have personal, personal versus page two, where we have the business income producing property, page three, uh, the the uh, theft for lost section for the Ponzi type. And then page four, we have an election to deduct federally declared loss in preceding tax year. So remember, this is important because if you're dealing with people that have a disaster that happened, 
then it's likely that it's going to wipe out their income. So the fact, and that means that they're not going to get as much of a tax benefit if they have to take the loss in the current year. So, so number one, if the disaster happened in 2023, then if you want to get the, the, the money as quick as possible, you would like to go back to 2022 so that hopefully you can get the funds sooner to deal with the loss that happened. And number two, uh, if the loss happened in 2023, then uh, your income might be a lot lower. So if I go to the Form 1040, if I was making 100,000, we know we have a progressive tax system. So my higher tax rate is gonna be higher. If my income dropped from 100,000 to like 30,000, then I'm gonna have a lot lower of a tax rate and this 33 this huge deduction that i get this year wouldn't be all that advantageous because i wouldn't have any income anyways and i wouldn't be owing much tax so the the ability to to take the loss in the current year or the prior year is something that that you want to keep in mind with those kind of losses uh, as well so that's just a general overview of that all right so let's remove that for now i'm going to go back on over and say all right let's delete that one and so now if I go back on over, so we're back to where we were. If I go into the schedule A and go into my schedule A, we also have uh, the trustee gambling uh, losses that might go in there as well. So that's gonna be in coincide with some kind of income that we saw in a prior presentation. So if I go into the schedule one, and if we had some kind of income for gambling winnings, if I go into that and say we had gambling winnings reported on a W2G, and let's say that was, uh, let's say that was uh, 10,000 of winnings. And then I'm gonna say this was from G winnings. And let's pull that on over here. So now we've got the form 1040 that it was 100,000 W-2, and then we've got the 10,000 from gambling winnings up to 110. I'm gonna have to report those gambling winnings, of course, to the government, because if the winnings were over a certain amount, the, the government's gonna have the W-2G uh, that was required to give it to us, also to them. And then the question is, well, what if I had losses with those gambling winnings? Well, if one, if you were a professional gambler, maybe you wouldn't be reporting it here but rather on a schedule c and then you might have a different situation because that would be your business but for most people you're not a professional gambler so then the question is if i have to report my income here where, what about the losses that i had to put in play and typically you can only put the losses on the schedule a and only up to the point of the winnings so in practice the question you're often might have to deal with if you have someone that does a lot of gambling the question is, well, do I have to track all my all my losses? Because that's kind of a pain to do. Well, if you're not if you don't expect to have much winnings or whatever, or if you're not close to itemizing at all, then it might not be beneficial because you'll have to clear this huge threshold of of in our case for the single file, the thirteen eight fifty, in order to even get the itemized deductions, even if you had winnings, right? Because you have to clear that threshold in order to get them. Uh, if they are itemizing, however, if they've cleared the threshold, then it might be worthwhile, of course, to try to uh, add up your losses, because then if you do have winnings, then you can net the losses possibly out at least to the extent of the winnings on the Schedule A, where you might have some benefit from it. So let's go back on over and let's go to the Schedule A and let's go to the itemized uh, uh, deductions. And let's say we had gambling uh, losses. Now, notice in this software, I'm going to say gambling losses. Oh, wait, there's an O. Oh, that means it's an override. Many softwares will have that. So I'm going to go, ah, is there a better way for me to enter those losses so I don't override something? And so I'm going to go, okay, well, let's go back into those winnings. And then I'll, I'll see in here that it has this losses up top. So I can go to the losses and say, okay, what if I had losses of something greater than the winnings? 20,000. Now remember that the losses are not something that you're going to get documentation for. The IRS doesn't have it either. Uh, but if you were to get audited, 
then you would have to produce the documentation. So that's how you'd have to, so you wanna make sure that you have the documentation, although you will not be providing the documentation and the casino obviously didn't provide the doc or whoever you got the winnings from didn't provide the documentation to the government, but they could still come after you in the form of an audit, in which case you'd have to produce the documentation. So now we've got the winnings still included at the 10,000 on the schedule A, then uh, we have the losses coming in, but those losses aren't enough. The 10,000, it was capped at 10,000 because that was the amount of the winnings, even though I put 20,000 in and that's not enough to push me over. So I didn't get any benefit from it because I'm not able to itemize. What are the things that usually help somebody to itemize? Owning a home because there's usually going to be a loan on it as well as the property taxes. So let's add those components and then we'll see we'll see what happens here. So if I go back in and I say that now we have itemized deductions and we're going to go that duh, 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 that they have that's not what I wanted. Itemized deductions schedule A and we're going to say that the interest will we'll say is at where's the interest 12,000 and then the taxes on the home real estate taxes once again we'll just say is the six thousand well not sixty six thousand and then if i go back on over now i now i'm getting a benefit from it because now i have state taxes six thousand plus to one thousand two hundred five seven thousand two hundred five and then i have the mortgage interest at twelve thousand now that ten thousand is giving me a benefit because it's taking me up to 29205 which clears the hurdle of the of the 13850 for a single filer so now i'm able to itemize if i see that over here on our worksheet we could say okay let's look at it this way i had winnings from gambling which i would see on the w2g and i'm going to say all right we had uh winnings on I didn't add it here yet. Let's add, let's add one here. I'm just gonna pull this down and I'm gonna call it gambling winnings. I thought I added that some at some point, but we'll we'll put it here. Gambling winnings, da 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 da. Did I spell it right? Probably not. Let's do review spell check gambling. Gambling. I told you, I bet you that I didn't spell it right. And I was right. 10,000. And then, so that pulls over now. Wait, it didn't. Let's sum it up. And then it'll pull over, summing this up down to here. And then that should pull over. So now we've got the 110,000. And then we're gonna say that the itemized deductions now, uh, let's add the, the taxes. So we had the real estate taxes of, we said 6,000 and the, the tax that they put in place for the sales tax, which we let the system calculate 1,205, 1,205. And then we said that the mortgage interest was 12,000, 12,000. That brings me to the 19,205, which allows me to, to then itemize. So now those losses will come into play and give me a benefit because I'm already over the standard deduction. So now I'm gonna say that we have uh, to do interest gifts to charity, casualty losses, other, I'm just going to put gambling losses and I'll put 10,000 here. Now notice it was actually 20,000, but I'm going to limit it to 10,000 because that's the amount of the winnings that I had. And so that brings it up to 29,205 going to the first page of the 1040. 29205 is greater than the standard deduction 13850 therefore we're taking the 29205 getting to the taxable income of 80795 is that what we have over here let's check it and we've got here the 87 80795 so that's the general idea with that one now remember we had some other ones that fall into this category i'm not going to go over to them in detail because i think those are the ones that you'll see most often but we had the gambling losses, the casualty and theft losses, the federal estate tax on income in respect of a decedent. 
So you have the state information, the deduction for amortizable bonds, which we talked about before, which I think most investors probably aren't going to have, which we talked about before, and ordinary loss attributable to a contingent payment debt instrument. So we talked about that in a prior presentation, not you know the most common of occurrences there. Deduction for repayment of amounts under a claim of right if over $3,000 certain unrecoverable investment in a pension and impairment related work expenses of a disabled person. So again, these are less common to come up, but if they do come up, you might want to keep them, of course, in the back of your mind so you can basically do more research uh, with regards to properly inputting those.